Yeah, hang on. There we are. Hi, everybody. Hey, we are trying to get this set up with Ed. He is in the green room and he can see us, but he can't hear us. And we're trying to figure out why. Um, if anybody has any suggestions, please let us know. Yeah, because we have some people that are pretty experienced with um, the technical I aspects. You. I can't hear you either, Ed. Um. <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah. So anyway, what do we got? We got 15 people in so far. Hey, Nick, welcome to the show. So you're... Um, when when you come log in on settings, when you go to your settings, what's your audio say? Default speakers. Okay, play around with that and 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 hit the test button. And until. It says uh, like default, whatever, and then there's right to the right, there's a button that says test. Okay, well, we're going to, I'm going to bring you up on screen. Tell me if you can hear us. Hey, every, oh, you cut yourself out. Bring yourself back in again, Ed. Okay. It's going to be good, folks. Growing pains. Yeah, he's 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 logging in here again. Here it comes. Now, can you hear us or put your phone on speakerphone? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you've got to go to that settings. You got to go to, you got to go to settings audio. You know what? Damn it! Damn it! Damn it, Ed! <laughs> Have another Red Bull. Oh, <laughs> people can hear this end of it. <laughs> Anyways, I'm going to translate for them. Ed's saying, hi, everybody. Oh, <laughs> this is going to be a while. Come on, you got to figure it. You got to go back and go back into settings and just play with it until you hear us. Yeah, because unmute himself. Like, our, is he muted? He's not muted on our channel, uh, John. He's not muted. Don't have anything marked mute in the settings. Go to settings audio. <laughs> okay. He wants me to play a Bruce Springsteen record while he's working it out. I'm not going to do that. Can we play the film clip? Would you like the introductory? Yeah, yeah. Film while film you're doing that, Ed, we're going to play your uh, Hamill uh, trailer. Okay, we'll do that. Okay, keep working on it until you think you can hear us. So anybody, I'm going to let everybody know, uh, Hamill on trial, who is, is a gentleman by the name of Ed Hamill, um, He's a musician. He's a traveling musician. He, he goes from town to town. He plays uh, venues. He plays uh, festivals. He'll play in your living room. Um, anyways, here's a short clip that gives you a little bit of history on, on Hamill on Trial. And I'll mute myself, and we can play this. Yeah. A wop bop, a loop bop, a lot bam boom is my guy. 
the immortal words of Joan Jett by way of that knucklehead pedophile Gary Glitter. I love rock and roll. Rock and roll will never forget. Rock and roll will never die. I got the rock and pneumonia, the boogie woogie flu, and I'm back, back in black, back in the USSR, back in the chain gang, back to let you know I can really shake them down. Hamill is a one man rock show. I don't know. How I describe it, a sober, bald headed townsman. I remember being very struck right away like, well, here's a different way of doing my job. Doing it yourself, that's one model. Um, but is it going to work for everybody? He will make a stage out of a table. He'll get on top of a table and start playing. Uh, doesn't everybody get it? And it kind of freaks you out a little bit. Like, am, I, am I the one of the chosen lucky ones, you know, that understand what this dude's doing? If it takes this much pain <laughs> to put out something this positive, this is it for me, man. This is my rumors. This is my dark side of the moon. This is my appetite for destruction. This is my back in black. I'm, I'm not doing this fucking again. We all have our job, you know. My job is to fuck with you. Your job is to forgive me. Thank you, Christians. Again, you're in the show. Everyone can see and hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, but I cannot hear you. Hello. Sign language? This means hi. That means anything. Right. Man. Okay. So far, we got jerk off audio. I don't know what to tell you. I went in the settings, everything. I don't know. I've done everything on my end that I can possibly do. My advice, my advice is: Can you keep them on can the phone? Go to while you're Facebook to Live or something? Should I'll keep you on the show? phone, Ed. Because we can hear Ed. So because of that, um, you can still have, me again. have a dialogue. So I would do that, and I'll go behind scenes now. I think we can run things. Say, just say, just ask a question. Ed, tell us about your album, et cetera. All right, sounds good. Hi, Ed. All right, I'll go behind scenes, Harry. Okay, now, so say something, so I'll see if I can hear you. You see, now I, now I, now I can't hear you on the stream. What if you what if you take the earplugs out and just listen to your phone phone and as you're watching it on your on your phone? Uh, hmm. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm going to hang up and see if you can just watch and listen on your phone. Oh, well, live TV, folks, or something like that. He is going to try to see if uh, he can hear it on his. The problem is he's using he's his using earbuds. His. What am I hearing? All right? I can hear you. I can hear you. Oh, whoa. Great. Did it work? Are we working? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Right. So, welcome, yeah. everybody. And I'd like to. Introduce you to Ed Hamill, also known as Hamill on Trial. Um, I met Ed many years ago when a good friend of mine, Bob, who I, I trust wholeheartedly when he recommends music. And Bob told me one night, day, he says, hey, you got to go to a, a gig up in Seattle and you got to see this guy. You're going to like him. There's, there's my Hamill on Trial shirt. And uh, Unbelievable. 
so I went to this show, and it was at a place called The Sunset in Ballard, Washington. And Ed walks out with his guitar, and the crowd's like, yay! And he gets up on stage, and he looks at everybody, and he goes, fuck you. I'm going back there. I'm coming out again, and I want to. I want you people to cheer for me. Right. I don't think they even gave me as much as you just gave me. Actually, you you might have been over. Yeah. Well, you know, I traveled away. You know. So you know, anyway, said, hey, what's what's up? Welcome to Seattle. You know, everybody, all the musicians there are killing themselves. So I'm there. You know, kind of filling in. So I knew I was going to like this guy. I'm right in the now. water, Harry. So hey, uh, let me let me preface this in a rare moment of seriousness. Thank you. I'm honored, really. I'm honored. I don't know if people know you've moved the music room. I've never been in it, the big one, as yeah. in that you're in right now. How many pieces of vinyl would you say that you have? Uh, in here, close to four thousand. Yeah. And and as there other places that we store vinyl as well. Well, 45s or 45s are on the garage, and there's about 4,000 of those. Those are not guns you're talking about. You're talking about. That's right. <laughs> right. And how many CDs would you have? Oh, God, I don't know. 1,000 maybe. Yeah. 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 And you and would every night. here to interview me. Because <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think people, well, it gives a context. It gives a context. I mean, we're pals, and I stay there. God bless you. You put me up. How's Becky and Rosie? Everybody good? Everybody's good. I remember one time Ed was here for a while for a, for a bunch of gigs, and he flew home back to New York, and I called him, and I, or no, I sent him a text, and I said, hey, you forgot a book. He texted me back, and he said, stay out of my room. <laughs> <laughs> right. Nosing around, probably looking for my underwear drawer. <laughs> so tell us about yourself. Tell us where you're from, how you got into music. Give us a background. Did you see the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, Harry? I did. So did I. So that there it began. Yeah. <laughs> we, I think you and I share that the first two British invasions. Um, you know, I'm a lot younger. I'm like 30 years younger than you, but I yeah, yeah. enjoy some of the same material you do. Um, so, you know, that. And it, we, a lot of people talk about, because I was only 10, when I saw that, yeah, um, you know, but I, you know, Kennedy had died six months prior and the world was, or the country was kind of in mourning. And then they came and boom, it was like Technicolor. I remember the Ed Sullivan shows and there was just a buzz, just a huge buzz. And then you thought, Hey, you know, you're looking at Ringo and he's just having a ball and he's with his friends. It wasn't to get girls. It was like the sounded great. And Ringo was all happy and stuff, playing with his pal. I'm like, hey, you know, that looks like a good life, better than my father seems miserable in his. So uh, <laughs> there it began. And then, you know, guitar lessons and a couple of folk masses. I were, I started working when I was 14, a little guitar store, a little mom and pop. You're bugging everybody. Can you show me this? And they're giving you records that you wouldn't hear, Miles Davis and whatever. And then, um, you know, a bunch of bands, cover bands. And then, um, I, I don't know, at one point I thought, in, older, like older, like 25 maybe, I better start if I, I should write songs. I, I was a late bloomer with the songwriting thing. Didn't think, I wanted initially to be a guitar player behind some other lead singer, uh, be a Keith Richards to a Mick Jagger or, a, you know. Mm -hmm. Brian made a Freddie Mercury or something like that. I didn't want to be the front guy, actually. But uh, but I also wanted, uh, when I got out of college, I wanted to learn how it was done. Get a van, get a little PA, do covers. And I couldn't really front sign a front guy, that I, so I did it, but really by default. And then, um, and then you know, for years, then... Mm -hmm. And all I, for, before I grew up in Syracuse, which is kind of a, you know, musically a very blues town. And it's a cool town. It's a tough, it's a blue collar. It's a tough town. But, um, you know, bands like Jake Isles and, and uh, Southside Johnny and, you know, and Bruce, um, Bob Seeger, 
you know, that blue collar sort of thing was, was big. And so I started and I loved it, you know, and it's so true. I mean, then the Ramones were coming in. It was kind of a, like the punk thing was happening anyway. Um, but I, so this band I started was called the works and it was kind of, um, like if the Ramones met, uh, she, Rachel you know, has a picture like of the Works album that she'll put up here while you're telling that. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they, then, yeah, then it kind of went synth pop. I mean, it because I sort of dug that synth pop thing too in the 80s. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. It, there was like two Works. Great record. Really. And, then, um, and then the Works, you know, a lot of gigs, and but never, you know, in retrospect, and I was a weak link, really. I and mean, they were good musicians. I don't that I, I had to learn how to write songs better, really. Anyway, so then, um, and I realized as I'm looking at thirty, that uh, it was going to be difficult to get these guys to travel and whatever. So, and I saw it was a farm aid, and I remember it was Neil Young, and he was playing solo in the middle of the crowd. It was really, it was really rocking. I was like. You know, this is more rock and roll than the last five bands I've seen at Farnade with all the people and everything. So that was a big inspiration. And then somebody handed me, it was on SST. It was the first uh, Roger Manning album, self-titled. But, you know, he was a guy with an acoustic guitar, wrote really cool songs. And um, uh, it was the the whole anti-folk thing. So I kind of got into that, moved to Austin. Um, I had been, oh, so I my wife did her undergraduate work in Albany, and I got a steady Wednesday night at a cafe working this solo thing out, like watching one man show Spalding Gray and Lily Tomlin, and and but also listening to music and anti folk and trying to figure out how I could make my living for the rest of my life as a solo artist, whether I got a big record deal or not. Be proud of myself and have fun and make you know a lot of people say. This ain't my first rodeo, you know, that cliche. It is my first rodeo, but I loved it so much. I stayed for 40 years, really. And just how to learn every aspect of it and have fun doing it. And that's what I did. And then I moved. I did a lot of the learning at this Wednesday night in Albany. If 12 people came, big night. It would have been awesome. Pass the hat, kind of. And then... um, Moved to Austin, and there was a place called the Electric Lounge. As a matter of fact, behind, I'm staying with the owner of the Electric Lounge. Is I, I'm sort of, uh, I'm here for the next five weeks. That's an Electric Lounge reunion poster you're seeing behind me. All the bands that used to play. I had a steady Friday night. Just all these really great bands. I would, it was an honor really to play the joint. And then, um, what was I going to say? That was, that was, that was not set up, Harry. That was something we did ourselves, just organically. I'm proud of us. What a team. How's Rachel doing? She good? Everything's She's happening. Good. How, how did you get signed to Mercury? The fucking the miracles. I don't know. How did Jesus change water into wine? Um, I was doing well. The, oh, so this place, the Electric Lounge, good, good question, good segue. You know, at the beginning of the night, they'd have like a film or for the, the happy hour. You know, they'd have like an artsy film or whatever, retro. And then, um, then they had a spoken word that was particularly, this is the nineties. So we're looking at about 94 and that slam poetry thing was breaking big, particularly in Austin. As a matter of fact, the Austin slam poetry team won that year and went on the Lollapalooza tour, uh, with slam poetry. So, and that was from like eight to nine. And then from 10 to two, they'd have all those sort of post-punk bands like cake. Cake was a thing here. And, um, that nine to 10 slot I knew it would be ideal if I could secure, if I could get every Friday, I was delivering pizza. So you could say, I'm playing it. You could be, a, you know, tell a joke and say, come down to the club Friday. And then, um, uh, did you have to clean the, the dough trays? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. He, he, <laughs> that dude would be like 45 now. That's hard to believe. You know, wow. I grabbed yeah. him by the nut. Yeah. So, so then, and then uh, so it was a South by Southwest. I was doing drawing very well at this club. There was a, another band <clears throat> called Prescott Curly Wolf. They were on the same little label I was on, Do Little, which ultimately became a label called New West now. And they were just fledgling at the time. 
And then um, they wanted to get this this uh, band signed, uh, Prescott Curly Wolf. They were a good band, good, cool. It was kind of like a like grunge meets like country almost. And then um, and they had, probably had hits. I don't know what happened. Doesn't matter. Um, it's like the Turtles. We've all watched the, how many managers the Turtles had. This is like you and I in the car, like talking. There's probably weed, a little bit of weed. We're in, I'm just giving a shit about the band Brett. Anyway. Um, he, he always they, gives me shit about liking bread. <laughs> when my yeah, dog they, started shoot, when yeah, I had my dog with a puppy, totally she chewed right. on the records. And, and Ed says, show her where the bread records are. <laughs> right. I'm always surprised because you have a penis. So why would you like them? Anyway, <clears throat> um, so they, so I was drawing pretty well. Cause, and it was the South by Southwest. Lots of bread. And K- K.O. Junkie has lots of bread albums. It's nothing to be proud of K.O. Anyway. <laughs> Right. And these are all friends of yours that are putting like David Gates songs. Oh, my God. Anyway, um, what was I going to say? I was doing well. They wanted to get this band signed. No one was going to come see them. They said to the record label said, would you open them up? And then people. Yes, I did. But I lucked out. But by being karmically, maybe the universe. Bless you, Madam Sam. Um, I'm reading the comments. I never get to you three times in the UK. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. yeah, thanks. I'll be back. I got to get my passport renewed. I'll be back. Oh, they make jokes. I like bread, but it's fattening. Right. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't fatten your intellect, though, does it? <laughs> so, so you got yeah, so that's, uh, And that's really how I got signed. They got signed, and there was a little bit of money left over. And the guy that signed me, Peter Lube, a nice guy, my A&R guy, and he was like, oh, this guy's wacky. Like, let's sign him, too. So that's how I got oh. signed. So, Rachel, show the red album the, with the black, this red and black is called Conviction. That'll be the, the his first major label album. No, Conviction isn't. That was a... Wasn't that 1989? Yeah, Blue Wave. Indie out of Syracuse. Oh, okay. Right. Well, I, yeah, that I don't have, so... You don't have that one? Dude, I'll no. look you up. Yeah, there's... Uh, that's the if one you, you turn it over, my father, you can see a picture. My dad's the judge on the other side. No, we can't. We can't flip it over here. But on this we don't thing. have that technology. No. Okay. Well, Do you know no. Jeff Bezos at all? Can you get a hold of him? Yeah, but he doesn't like me to talk about it. <laughs> okay. So uh, after you did conviction, uh, if I'm correct, then you did. Uh, then, I moved, then I moved to Austin, right? A whole bunch of different kind of songs. For, well, I would Conviction, Albany, writing a bunch of different kind of songs. Oh, Alan C. loves us. Um, hey, Alan. Alan. He's yeah. a good guy. Um, I'll go to Albany, write a bunch of different songs, move to Austin, and then I, the Mercury Universal album, Big As Life, actually was released initially as an indie on Doolittle. Okay. Somebody said uh, Harry needs his guitar strings changed. Well, you know, you know that's John. Yeah, that's my like my room and board. Like I got a. <laughs> I don't. I yeah, never change stay, my strings. You can stay here, but you got to. <laughs> then I make them change all oh, my guitar. Okay, oh, junkie. Well, wait, it's John. It's John. Go smoke some pot, John. Leave us alone. <laughs> I got nothing but new songs for you. Buddy, <laughs> don't you wish you had John's hair though? He's got a nice full head of hair. You could be getting I wish I had guitars. <laughs> so okay, so the next album, Big as Life, correct? Correct. Okay, so um, and that was the major that, label shebang. From that album, can you play the song Big as Life for us? Yes. Okay. Anything for you. Uh, Doing that, Rachel. I even went out to the car and got my capo. That's that's how that's how much I care. Oh, care. Wow, I know. You're You've done this. Do this is not your tabs, I just, Out of curiosity, do all those yellow tabs say bread or no? <laughs> no. <laughs> There's actually one of those yellow tabs that says, "Let me show you one." <laughs> is there a bread? <laughs> Now, 
these you only get a yellow tab if you have more than five records in my collection. Before, okay, I get to ask a question. What's that? Oh yeah. Oh, that's no, oh, no. I'm honored, dude. I really am honored. <laughs> I mean that. We joke around a lot, but it's 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 very cool of you. Okay. You so I I'll play this song, but I have a question for you. So you got all the you used to own a record store. Yeah. And you, you oh, I the know. can I tell that story real quick? Tell any story. You're, yeah, it's your gig, isn't it? It's not Hamill's music. So right? I, I, you know, once I saw you play that show in Seattle, um, and then I started going to see, all, you know, anytime you'd come around, you did a gig up in at the Vancouver Folk Festival. And I went to that show, and you were there, and Dan Byrne was there. Remember that? You, t I didn't know you, but you took a picture of the blood of, and with the right. right. I forgot that. And, yeah. and uh, so it was you, Dan Byrne, and Utah Phillips on stage. Yeah, that, was on, that was a big honor, too. Right? Trading songs. But uh, I talked to you then, and that's when I really got to know you. And and you screamed at the crowd, I bleed for you. And I took <laughs> a picture of your guitar, and it had blood all over it from your, you were playing so hard. Yeah. And uh, that's, so then I contacted your label your rep and i said hey i'd like to have ed come and play at my record store for my 10th anniversary and you came it, they agreed to it and what i did is i handed out tickets to my customers because we were doing it at the, at the coffee shop on the corner so as my customers would come in i'd say here's a ticket come you know my the people that came in all the time that i knew my regulars and just as a 10th anniversary so you came and you did the show and uh you slept in the Flying J parking lot the night before, you said, waiting yeah. for the show. I won't, then, I don't, can I just say, I got to interrupt parenthetically. Am I still here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, Loves, you know, the other trucks, they won't let you yeah, spend yeah, the night. Yeah. So I don't, they don't get any of my money. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, so you come and you did the show. Yeah. And after the show, you said to me, uh, so you didn't sell any tickets? You didn't charge for this? And I said, no, it was a present to my customers. And you said, it was like a $500 show that night. And you said, just give me 300 bucks. And I oh. thought, what a guy, what a guy, you know? So ever, ever since then, we kind of became friends and the rest is history. Yeah, well, you know, let's be frank. I was planting a seed to stay at your house for free for the next 10 years. So for 200 <laughs> yeah. bucks, that's a really good deal. I don't know if you know what it costs to stay at the Motel 6 these days, but they, you know, what's his name? Switched up on the gang there. Okay, so anyways, this you, is a song called Big in Life. My phone, I can hear you audio-wise, but we've we've stopped, but I don't need to see you necessarily. You can see me okay? Absolutely, no problem. Okay. And you want to hear Big as Life? Yeah. I haven't warmed up today, but we'll... Tip a tip from the cloud. Thought we was in this together. I got another 30 miles to go. And you change your mind like the weather. But I know how you feel though. With that blinding light didn't flash. I'm all alone now, but I got my guitar. Let's think about some stuff. We can smash. Well, I slept last night by the side of the road. I was thinking about the nearest phone. I was wondering if she would accept the charges. I was wondering if I had a banana for a backbone. Then I had a dream about Count Basie, but he didn't want to talk to me. Had a lot of hurt in his face. It had a copy of Life Magazine. Had Elvis on the cover. It had not been. I did not say who was written by. A closer inspection, I noticed that Albert Goldman was still writing. Life wouldn't let him die. Basie opened up that magazine 
the page dirty, threw it at me, turned around, he walked away. I said, oh, man, that's Count Basie. He's like my hero. We could have hung out. I had so many questions. There were so many things that I wanted to say. But after 12 glossy pages of big life magazine format, people with guns, knives, smoke, and crack, I stepped back from that magazine. My mouth flew open because all those people were black. I used to work at a bar in Syracuse, New York. We had what we jokingly referred to as an incident most every night. There were drug sales, there was guns, there was people fighting, but all those people were white. True story, I pulled a pregnant girl out of the bathroom one time. She was in there over an hour. People were complaining. She was smoking crack. She was white as snow. She was white as blow. And she was most definitely not black. And I think Count Basie was just trying to point out that if I wasn't careful, I might fall in a trap. Because take a look at that magazine. Am I an acid or what? But it appears to me someone's getting a bad, bad, bad rap. Page 36 and 37, there was Sony Adams, a white family. They were hanging out by the swimming pool. Couldn't see the mother. Just a reflection in the water. She was holding the video camera. What color was she? Well, let's not be a fool. So there we go, and as big as life, and Count Basie, he don't want to talk to me. And Miles Davis never rang my phone off the hook. I'm not anticipating any phone calls from Spike Lane. Roger Manning said something about hatred and being any color, being not. It's a look around this whole big world, not just this room here tonight, or any room that you're looking at me and through your little YouTube thing. Any YouTube in any country, in any country on this planet, it's blue. Baby blue. That's the color that we all got. I got another 30 miles to go and you change your mind like the weather. But I know how you feel alone for that blinding lightning flash. I'm all alone now as usual, but I got my guitar. Let's think about some stuff we can spend. Let's think of some stuff we can spend. Oh, nice. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, tell us just, you don't have any jokes, do you? Not that you seem to think are funny. <laughs> how, about, how about the old timer that applies for the job and the, 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 interviewer says, what do you think is your worst fault? And the old timer says, I think I'm too honest. And the interviewer says, I don't think honesty is a fault. And the old timer goes, I don't give a fuck what you think. <laughs> is that a typical Harry Music Room joke? That's a typical Ed joke, yeah. Yeah. Well, I like, I like people... the one about the, the penguin. The little penguin going across the country in his little penguin car. It's a hot day. Hot day. You know, temperatures around here, Harry, in Austin, Texas, 102, 103 degrees. No problem. It's one of those kind of days. And he's traveling in his car. Engine starts to make noise. You know how scary that can be. If you're away from home, he's a penguin. It's hot. So he brings it into the mechanic. Mechanic says it's going to take me a couple hours to get to the bottom of this. Penguin says, no problem. Get to the bottom. But he goes across the street to the 7-Eleven. And he gets in the freezer case because it's nice and chilly in there. He gets a little. And then I don't know if you know this here, but those penguins love that vanilla ice cream. Crazy about it. He grabs the haagen -Dazs. He's got the love. And he got all over him, the vanilla ice cream. Go back over. How's my car? And just says, you blew a seal. He said, no, no, vanilla ice cream. <laughs> and when I do children's parties, that's a big one because they love the animals, you know. <laughs> so, uh. That segues right into my question about... Uh, <laughs> right. Nothing like a little, yeah, seal jism to get us to the next... <laughs> right. So that leads right into my question about... Uh, I don't, tell us the story of you meeting John Lennon. Oh. Or you hey. can either tell us the story or by chance you have a song about it. I do. I do. <laughs> 
See, here's the thing, people. You let me stay at your house and drive me around and you request up the yin yang. You get it. <laughs> See if I can do it. I am warmed up, so hold on a second there, mister. This would be a, you know, as we, because I do pace the show. It seems like I'm an idiot up there, but I have, so you, you, you end a segment with this big, you know, so I don't know. Hold on. My wrist. It's all on the wrist, Harry. Wasn't that F Troop? What about F-troop. it? Remember Agar and it was all on the wrist? Yeah. You, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. Do you know, so do you remember the Indians, what the tribe's name were? No. The Hakawis. But okay. it comes from a joke, the Fuckawis. Because when they asked the, Indi- the the Native Americans, how did you come up with their names? And we got lost. We were like, hey, where the fuck are we? <laughs> that's, and that's, what, that's true. That's why they were called the Hakawi. Okay. This is like, if we should have a show like Jerry Seinfeld, like Ed and Harry driving in the car. We put on Sirius and, you know. <laughs> we start to, do we do name that tune? See who can yeah. name it first. Yeah. I used to do it with my, my ex-wife, who is actually a wonderful woman. We get along great. But I used to say shit like, um, for five points, you know, how, who's the bass player on this song? And then finally she came back to me. She goes, if these points aren't redeemable at Pier 1, I don't want to play anymore. <laughs> That's true. She's a tough broad, man. She was, she's cool. Detroit's mother. Want to hear a story? Real quick story? Sure. Okay. So, right. So this song, John Lennon, oh, I got myself a little segue organically, too. I didn't anticipate this. Anyway, um, so this comes from my second major label release, The Court is Mighty Than the Sword, uh, produced by the Butcher Brothers, Phil Nicolo, great guy, whatever. Anyway, but I got dropped. I got dropped from the major, which led to Chooch Down. We'll talk about that if you want. But anyway, so this is now, now we're at dinner that night, the night I get dropped. So I'm very quiet. And my wife says, she's across the table. How long is this going to last? And I'm like, what? She goes, the brooding, the quiet. The melancholy. How long is this going to last? I'm like, I don't know. You know, I tried my whole life to get a major label deal. I just lost it today. You know, could I get 24 hours to like bum out? She goes, you know, you should have gotten the porn business. She goes in the porn business when they fuck you in the ass. At least they pay you and answer your phone calls. (laughs) Pretty good, right? (laughs) I can pick them, Harry. Okay, let me see if I can do it. True story. In eighth grade, I was short, had glasses, and a squeaky ass voice that refused to change. Two things dominated my thoughts James Cartino and John Lennon. Cartino, I came in contact with daily in gym class where he beat the shit out of me at every opportunity. Lennon, I came in contact with in my wildest dream. <laughs> In 1971, John Lennon spent a week in my hometown, Syracuse, New York. Yoko gave an exhibit in a museum there. Some friends of mine skipped school and got hired to do odd jobs for her. I tell them of my day at Cartino County. They tell me about their day with John and Yoko. I was envious as hell. My friends told me there was to be a private party, and I begged them to sneak me in. They were skeptical, but agreed. I waited outside the museum for about eight hours. I had a piss real bad, but I didn't dare leave. At about midnight, the back door opened, and I snuck in. I couldn't believe my luck. I'd be invisible. I'd watch. I'd wait. The room was dark and crowded, and I saw Alan Ginsburg and some others I recognized, but no John and Yoko. After an hour, I felt I could risk a much-needed trip to the men's room. I made my way through the crowd, entered the hallway, took a few steps, and looked up to see Lennon approaching. A group from the party had targeted him, and from behind me, they rushed. I was carried, it seemed, in slow motion, on a path, straight as a bullet. Closer. 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 Closer till my chest slammed into John Lennon. John Lennon looked down at me and barked, fuck off. It sucked to be me. I hit the men's room. But who 
compound buzz from Lenny's visit lasts in a month. For me, of course, it lasted longer. Cartino thrashed me the following Monday, but it didn't seem to hurt as much. Something had changed for all my life. I didn't cry when Lenny was murdered. I was angry, bewildered. I respected him so much. I mean, even it felt guilty. Last year, while getting my baggage at LaGuardia Airport, I found myself next to his son, Sean, tall, handsome like his father, with his mother's beautiful eyes. The son Lenny never got to see become a man. And now that I'm a father, I understand this more than ever. It was then I noticed I was crying. Let's see if David Bates can do that shit. <laughs> so, so you literally did run into him. Yeah, I pushed into him. I pushed into him. And then wow. about a year later, I was with my girlfriend at the time, and we were in Manhattan. Uh, and bear in mind, you know, you were from, we were not Brewerton. Where were you from? Binghamton. Binghamton, right. So upstate New York is like completely different. They, when people say, oh, you're from New York, they think like Manhattan. No, it's like we're in dairy country where we yeah. were. But we, I had to be visiting Manhattan with my girlfriend. And I saw Lennon with a, an Asian gentleman walking across the street. And my girlfriend at the time, she was like, that's John Lennon. Should we go on over now? Let's leave the guy alone. You know? Wow. Yeah, at least you saw him. Wow. Yeah, you know, it was funny, too, because this is really hard to explain. And oddly enough, like the Beatle cartoon sort of captured it. But he had a walk. He had a very distinctive walk. And so, I mean, this is, you know, what a fanboy. I mean, first of all, Syracuse had nothing exciting ever happened, you know. So when she threw but we had this beautiful museum. It, it was uh, the architect was E.M. Pai, who's the same guy that did the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So Syracuse has a couple. Matter of fact, uh, the Syracuse University has a building that was uh, uh, designed by this E.M. Pai and this Everson Museum. And I think Yoko probably thought, in justifiably so, I could throw him a birthday party up there. We could have a mutual art exhibit or whatever, and we'd be away from the press. I mean, there were some people up there. I, matter of fact, the first draft of that John Lennon song, who else did I see there? Like Dennis Hopper was there. Um, as I said, Alan Ginsberg. Um, what's his name? Uh, I should know. The, the editor of Rolling Stone, who's retired. Oh, yeah, Wiener. Yeah, he was there. Uh, yeah. You know, just a bunch of a bunch of fucking cool people. Uh, Nikki Hopkins. Ringo was supposedly there. I didn't see him. Anyway, um, in 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 his the, that rolls that the flowered rolls that was like parked in the garage below when everybody was kind of getting in it, leaving notes and shit. So it was very, you know. Syracuse, nothing freaking happened ever, you know? So this was yeah. like, your head was exploding, you know? But I, you could look through, watch him walking around through the window. There was like a little slot. And he was walking around. And it was like, wow, that's his walk. Like, I've seen this walk a million times. Very distinctive. Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent. Well, they, they also owned a dairy farm in upstate New York. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she sold the cow for like half a billion dollars. Did she, she sold a fucking breeding cow for like five hundred thousand dollars. Wow. He, he Lennon, and after that, Lennon said, "You got to admit, I can pick them. Her and McCartney, like, you know, <laughs> I'm betting a thousand in terms of friendships, you know." Yeah. Wow. Um. So my favorite album of yours. What do you think? What do you think is my favorite album of yours? Oh, I, 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 for the, I don't know the one that sounds the most like Ryan Adams. I don't know which one. Chooch Town. Okay. You because of the stories? Yeah. 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 Well, thank you. Yeah. So Chooch Town was, so I got dropped, and then um, I might have to, hold on, I, it hasn't yet, I forgot, I should have plugged my phone in, which is not going to be a big deal, but I might have to, whatever. Um, I got dropped and then, you know, wanted to keep on going by any means necessary. So borrowed, borrowed a four track cassette player. Want to hear a, a wild story? You, I don't know if I ever told you this story. Want to hear a story? Sure. Okay. So when I got signed to Mercury, Rough House Records, which is more of like a hip hop label, you know, had great success with the Fugees and Lauryn Hill or whatever. 
they kind of wanted to sign me too, but they had, they had brought my video up to uh, Tommy, whatever the frick and Sony. And he was like, no, this is not the guy. But anyway, but they were always cool to me. Chris Schwartz and the butcher brothers, they were always really nice. And, and so I met this guy, Bill, you're going to freak when I, I don't know that I've ever told you the story. So this is all true. Um, I met this guy, Billy Nagorski, and Billy Nagorski managed his younger brother's band. Uh, Billy was maybe 24 at the time, and his brother was 17 years old. And they had been signed to Rough House, but they had gotten dropped. And he says to me, he goes, hey, Ed, we took our advance money and we built a studio in the basement. And if you'd like to record in this studio, um, we'll record you for free. We just want to do it. He's just a great guy, Billy Nagorski. So I'm assuming this is going to be like an animal house kind of wild. No, he lives in the sub, very nice suburban home, similar to yours, actually, now in retrospect. And with his parents, dad's a roofer, got a roofing company. His mother, I said, could single-handedly give Catholicism a good name. And I go there, and, and that's how I recorded Chuchan, which is, there's boatloads of stories there. He's recorded back rebel motorcycle club there and you just sort of live with their family for like months it's insane and sh and the mother would always take in strays from the neighborhood so if you got in a fight with your parents or whatever so billy becomes very dear friends with a with a kid they're 13 year old kids and jason mirror has jason has a fight with his parents and he gets taken in in the degorski residence these boys are 45 year old friends still friends now and they mess with each other, kind of like you and John, just giving each other shit all the time. So there's two kids in the bedroom when they're 13 years old. And, and Billy might say, when I get older, I'm going to, you know, they have rock and roll dreams. And I, when I get older, I'm going to get a strap. And Billy says, you should get a strap because, you know, Ryan, Ad Ryan Adams has got a strap. Brian Adams has got a strap. And he's a jerk off. And you're a jerk off. When I get, you know, older, I'm going to get a less ball. And then... Jason would say, you should get a Les Paul because Mick Jones from Foreigner, Foreigner's got a Les Paul. He's a jerk off. You're a freaking jerk off. And they get all the way to the Zamatis guitar. Do you know the Zamatis guitar at all? No. Okay. Handmade in London and only cool. Like Keith Richards has one. Ronnie Wood has one. Mark Boland had one. And this becomes their Lexus. This becomes their, when they get famous, they're going to get the Zamatis guitar. Okay. Now fast forward I got to, I'm going to have to, after I finish the story, I got to go get my plug to plug this in. But anyway, fast forward to now and through a series of weird events, Jason is, has met uh, because he got in this band called Kasabian who are touring with Oasis while Zach Starkey is the drummer. He meets Ringo's daughter, this Jason. Okay. And they fall in love. They get married and they have children. So now Ringo is his father-in-law. Okay. And these guys still mess with each other. So, like, Jason will call Billy and go, Billy, I'm at Ringo's house. I just played George Harrison's guitar. Tom Petty's here, and we all did coke. Bye and hang up. Right? <laughs> this is true. So he currently plays guitar with Liam Gallagher's solo band, Jason does, right? About six months ago, they Skype each other. They're 45-year-old men. They Skype each other, and... It opens up because he's on tour in Japan with Liam Gallagher, and it opens up to an empty hotel room. Theme from Rocky starts, dun, 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 and in from the side comes the headstock of the Sumatis guitar because they brought him to the factory and they gave him two. Well, now Jason leans his head in and just goes like this. However, a month later, package at the door, and one of this is a story of friendship, of manifestation of rock and roll and Billy gets the Sumatis guitar and the dreams that those boys had. This is all true. You can look it up. Jason Muir plays with, you know, was in BDI, the one after Oasis. And now it's insane, but that's a true story. Ringo was his father-in-law. That's better than wow. getting, you know, John Lennon in the press. I go to get my plug or we're, this is going to end. Okay. Okay. All right. You In the meantime, entertain them. Talk to Rachel or some shit. Hello, Rachel. You're doing a good job back there. You're muted. I was <laughs> muted. I got I because I mute myself so I don't you know say anything while I'm behind stage and stuff. But the stories that Ed has are just fantastic. Uh oh. 
Yeah, we'll leave we'll this leave up this so that people. Well, this can is going to be kept up. Yeah. yeah. Now this is fantastic, and uh, I mean, uh, yeah, a BDI. The the that whole story is uh, just remarkable. So, and Alan, big you're, saying, you're saying you do have a gig booked for him? Now, Ed's also a painter. Can okay. you bring up well, well, Ed, Ed, Ed is back and we're all plugged in. But I'm still stationary. You know, my thing's sort of locked out. Can I leave and come back in? Can you can you entertain them for another 60 seconds or no? Sure. So you're okay, going to... Okay. Okay, I'll be right Hopefully back. It'll, the audio will right work. Back. Yep. Right. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. It's going good. Oh, my God. Oh, uh, Wallace, you're so right. This is a lot of... Uh, if, if any of you are in the Northwest, uh, he's going to be here December... Uh, he's flying in December 6th. He has a gig at a place in Seattle called The Shanty on December 9th. And uh, we're working on shows for the 10th and 11th as well. So we'll let people know more as they come in. Yeah. Uh, this is fantastic. Really. Have, really you ever, have you ever been to the Vancouver Folk Festival? I haven't. I'm over on the island. You know, nothing preventing me from going, but it's just I yeah. don't get off this damn island much. But when I do, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I do uh, You head over to Vancouver. Here's that. Yeah, I'm back. I'm back and good. If that means anything to okay. you. Okay. I'm okay. So um, we talked about Chooch Town, and that, of course, is my favorite album. And if you could, I'd like to hear that song. The time. If you look at my Discogs, my user ID on Discogs is Chooch Town. Oh, really? Yeah. You like a lot of people too, so it's it's nice. Yeah, but, yeah. I, I mean, you're not up there. You're not up there with bread, but you're close. No, I, I don't even. But I'm on the rise. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, that a pun? Here, here, I have a question. So you have all this vinyl that you love. You have the CDs. You listen to music every day and definitely every night. Am I right? No. You wouldn't miss a day. Right. That's correct. Go to boatloads of live shows. How many times do you see Bruce Springsteen? Mm, I don't know, 34, 35 times maybe. Yeah. Right. And that was just last week. <laughs> yeah. um, why, why do you think music resonates with you as a time? I mean, you, you need it, really. And I'm not being in a rare moment of seriousness. Well, so it's, you, you know... Huh? It literally, I mean, I have two brothers who are 15 or more years older than me. So I literally grew up uh, an only child because they were gone. And my mom worked. My dad passed away when I was just, you know, four or five. Those were just your friends coming over the radio. So my mom worked. I was home alone a lot and I listened to music constantly. You know, and I bought my records and I played them over and over and over and over. And it, it was my life. And it still is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Right on. I wanted okay. to get to the bottom of that, Harry. I think I put some time. Okay. Well, I could just do Chooch Town or I could do the lead in the Bobby to Chooch Town because that kind of gives you the two sides of the story. But I'll just do Chooch Town if that's what we prefer. If we have, if we okay. have time. And, and lean back like you are because when you lean in, it kind of overpowers your microphone. What? Yeah. There you go. All right. I'm okay. at a different angle now. But. So do you want to hear? You can um, do what you want to do. Do what you want to do. Well, okay. However you want to do. Okay. I'm going to do these two. Then I am going to do something I want to do. I mean, I these are all my children, Harry. I am I like every one of them. So, yeah, let me do. So, Chooch Town was almost like a little village. You've gone. And um, in my head. And it was crazy. So all my friends, a lot of these are true stories. I grew up uh, similar to uh, Harry, very lucky, 
very, you know, I had a wonderful upbringing. My dad worked for Carrier and whatever, safe and nice and food and clothes and whatever. But they, they were kind of, you know, they were older and they were kind of gone too. So music is very similar. We're, there's my friends, the posters on the wall, like, you know, uh, all that stuff. And I would have a dream, I, like a little town in my head. I would go to, some nights I'd go to the movies in the little town. Occasionally it still comes up every once in a while. I think this, I don't know, whatever. So I thought, oh, be cool. and I was probably, oh, Pulp Fiction, the Tarantino thing had just oh, come out. Oh. And I was listening, there was a Biggie Smalls album that I love. And so those were kind of influenced. The story song, I always got a kick out of. So this, all of this is true. <laughs> anyway, these are all true stories. That I'm not a detective, other than the fact that, that you know. I don't want to be around when Bobby comes down. You know how that can be. You can know better than me. I don't want to be here when Bobby gets clear and it gives you that weird eye. I think I better say goodbye. Yeah, the party always starts out really cool. The Bobby's got a cool time himself. It's gonna hang here when he's high. You couldn't find a nicer guy. He would give you his own shirt. He starts to crash again. So it was me, it was Bobby, it was old Chooch and Tim. Chooch is all right. You can always count on him. Bobby can be cool if he's hanging out here. He gets too high and goes out. Well, that's when things get weird. So we're going to the tunnel house to get something to eat. The food's pretty good at 3 a.m. This time it was beef. We're sitting at the booth to tell you the truth. Bobby's throwing stuff around. He's acting real uncool. And I said, it's only moments till the manager calls the cops. Bobby gets all quiet. Down in his eggs, he drops. He passes out the table. He wakes up and heaves. And there's fun all over the counter. And he pays the check and leaves. He's almost to the corner. Out comes the waiter. Bobby says, get the fuck off. And yet it wasn't sick until I ate here. Bobby smacks the waiter. Put on, on his phone. Two says, hey, with Bobby. That's just the way it goes. And Bobby feels bad, from what I can guess. Because the next day, he sends a mop to the title house. UPS lights up a fat and stretches his legs. He says, oh, man, I got to learn not to put that chili on my head. Bobby always starts out really cool. Then Bobby's got to go and find himself. Oh, I guess you got to stay. Bobby likes to throw that way. I hope you'll be all right. I'll be back tomorrow night. I don't want to be around when Bobby comes down. I don't want to see my, uh, uh, choreography. I need choreography. Okay, same story, different perspective. Well, my name is Chooch. I don't know what you heard about the night in question. Word. It's only half the story because a lot of all went down and hang out with Bobby. He's a clown. You might, you might sell him drugs or a stereo that's hot, but I hang out with players. Bobby definitely is not. I hang in bars. Sometimes I got a credit card scam. I got a call from a pussy. He thinks he's the man. Some kind of hot shit player. A friend to the star. Bad, busy money. Stop it, bad. He got me up to his office because he knows I know the street. He says, hey, close the door. I said, ooh, very discreet. See, this has got a little problem. Maybe I can check his issue. Sure, make a foul. I say, yeah, what the heck? You see, he's got a famous client that had a house clean, did the old ways and one. You can know what I mean. If a house name stole some photos of him with some kids, and if there's such a service, this client hits his kids. He's a black man, but I didn't ask how much. He gave me an address and said, okay, I'd be in touch. And hey, where'd you go? Where'd you go? Where'd you go? I'm the church, don't you know? Where'd you go? Where'd you go? Well, I check out the address. She moves out on the 15th. There's a guy, Joe Brooks, lives there. He's filled with these. You see, she moves out at night, and she don't pay the rent. And she's got a bump and call the shots, but he doesn't know what to do. Then Joe remembers his wife as a cook in the title house. So I go back and take a look. It's a graveyard ship. I'm there about 3 a.m. I ask about the photos. Things get out of hand, so I stuff them in the cooler. I rearrange his face. I wrap him in the pockets. I find a lease out of the place. I hear noises in the back. I got up on their evening, and they're fucking Bobby, man, giving a place up for 
So now you played uh, the Edinburgh Festival. What yeah. was that all about? Uh, well, then after Chuchtown, um, I had a car accident. I was touring a lot with Annie DeFranco at the time, playing to uh, opening for her and, you know, playing to enormous crowds that uh, I learned. She was a very wonderful person and a, an incredibly gracious uh, uh hostess or if you will uh, a supporter uh, and I there was rumor that I was going to get signed to her label um, but it was fun just fun I hadn't really done that tour bus thing before and her crew was great and um, you know you're playing to I mean that Universal Amphitheater played that was 11,000 people so that was the most people I've ever played to and so and they were recording me live every night for her I think she was going to produce me um, and so then I got in a car accident, so they couldn't have been any nicer. They like called me up and said, Hey, you know, you making any money? Nice. I'm like, no, I'm not. I was, I was in an upper body brace 24 seven for nine months. I flipped a car twice, 82 staples in my head, broke my wrist, broke my ankle, broke T1, T2, T3. So while I was laid up, um, they gave me the tapes. They were like, you produce it yourself. And then uh, George uh, Fontaine from New West Records, he, uh, bless him, uh, produced it for me. So I had CDs and I sold them and I was able to make money. And then she did sign me to her label and we did two records uh, with that. And in the middle of that, um, I got management um, and they were kind of like, um, they had managed yeah. Bill Hicks, the comedian, and Bill had broken out of the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. So they went to Ani and said, how would you feel about producing a show? Because it costs a lot of money. And um, we did. Then we went to Edinburgh. I did it two years. And it's 3,000 acts from around the world. They give away seven awards. I was lucky enough to win one of them. I worked real hard on the show. It was about called the terrorism of everyday life. And um, it was about, you know, me and my father, really, kind of, in a, in a good way. <laughs> and then, and then um, yeah. That, and that and that it was good. It was, it was a great experience. Cool theaters. I'm in kind of. I'm in Austin now. I, I can't say too much, but I'm working on something with some people uh, to get back into theaters. But that's why I moved to some extent. The, the young man has grown up now. You know, I can leave the nest. <laughs> um, if anybody that's watching has questions for Ed, go ahead and post them there, and we'll see what he. Why do you? Why do you yeah. exist? <laughs> so, um, while you were in that, you know, you said you were in a body cast for that. That CD really helped you then because it gave you some income when you weren't able to Absolutely. get out. Oh, they were great. Oh, I, you know what? I have to be honest with you. I've never, all my label experiences, three, because Tuchtown, even though I put it out myself, it got picked up by Evangeline over there, um, who had been Silvertone prior. Anyway, four, five, six, seven. So this is my seventh label. I don't know, man. I've had nothing but good experiences. People have been nothing but nice to me. Never told me what to do. Whatever, you know. 
I don't know. I can't bitch, really. The stuff I put out, the things I say, just the fact that they put it out, it's cool. You know? <laughs> really, I'm watching. Um, tell us about your guitar. Um, well, uh, does my guitar have a name? It really doesn't, John. Um, I think it's, I, I was going to call it Koa Wannabe. Koa Wannabe? Koa Wannabe. Like, it's not Koa, so it's not really where John wants to go. Um, in my, it's a 1937 L double, oh, right. Somebody got it, right? B, B, yeah, that's what it is. And um, I don't know. I've had it since 1989. Uh and I'm way too dependent. I have a lot of guitars, but this is the one, always the one. It's like an old sneaker, slipper, whatever, T-shirt. When you fit in, it's just, you know, it's a, so for me, I mean, all the varnish is worn away. I mean, I don't know for you guitar geek kind of people. All the varnish is worn away, so it's really good. And then I sweat a lot, so these things break, but we put varnish, and then there's little struts. I think that's what they're called, um, that in there. And then, so I made it through here. That's actually a Jerry Lee Lewis record. Uh, that's a Jerry Lee Lewis record. Okay. Move it more in front of the camera so we can see it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so there you go. So I made it through yeah. there, and that's a Jerry Lee Lewis live. Um, and then I made it through there, but it's a bra there's a brace under it, so it never made it through. And then... Um, this is kind of, you know, the, sometimes I do the drum thing. So that's that. And then the little specks are my blood, actually. <laughs> I bleed for you people. Here's and, a question uh, for you, Ed. Can you see it? it? It's, it's a very spirit. I don't know. I mean, I'm not one of these new aging guys. I'm really not. But there's a definitely when I put it on and I, I mean, it's just incredibly comfortable. It, it's weird because I think about it like I'm very... I'm infinitely more comfortable on stage than I am off stage. Like in the grocery store, I always feel like, hey, but on stage, I, and it, it didn't start like that, man. I, I think back when I, so all those bands I was telling you about, cover bands, I was petrified. And, and I look back and go, I'm really glad that I kept at it. I don't, I, normal people would go, this is too much anxiety and too much stress. But I kept, kept at it. I was like, I want to do this. I want to make this my life. I want. Do you, do you see this I, question I here? I'm glad I didn't give up. I'm surprised I didn't give up. Really. See this? Can you read that question? No. Sounds good, Ed. Hey, I live south of Boston. Do you play any gigs in the area, Groon Hall, Scott Dog? Um, no, I don't have a room here yet. He just moved there. I'm kind of in a. It's, it, I'm in a mark. I'm in a mark. There's whiteboards every day. Um, I think I'm going to play one gig in Austin in October. Then I got to go out again because I, I have holiday stuff. So I go back east from November 15th to January 15th. And then I'll come back and we'll be hitting this theater thing hard. Not that we're not doing that every day. Hey, other than the Beatles, where are your music inspirations? Anyone you like to tour with, you haven't yet. Had an opportunity to do so. Yeah, Pussy Riot, I would like to tour with. That would be pretty great. Um, I, you know, I got a bazillion influence. I mean, that whole, at the beginning, it was the British invasion. And then, you know, then Keith Richards is talking about blues guys. See, so you're going there. And, you know, the Muddy Waters and the Robert Johnson and Skip James and those guys. No, no and you like. I was in a glam, you know, glam. I just saw the Bowie thing the other night. I really, everybody's like giving it shit. I enjoyed the heck out of it. I thought it was awesome. Um, you're then, you're you a know, big glam, fan of. And then, there, believe it or not, there was a little period of Prague in high school. Like, I think I saw King Crimson, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, those bands. You're and a then, big uh, fan of people close. from Detroit, right? Bands from Detroit. I do. Like, wait, 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 I got some. Just to show you, I've committed to a sound. I'll have Manchester on my you're a big You're a big Iggy Pop fan? Oh, that's it. Yes, I am a big Iggy fan. And, and the MC5 and the Stooges. and uh, But all that Detroit stuff. Right up to Eminem and the White Stripes. From back to Motown and Bob Seger. And, and 
it, it has an ad. Manchester's the same way in England. They're, like all the bands from Manchester, I kind of love, and there's a certain swagger, and I and I sense it in the band, in all the Detroit bands. It, there's just a what's you know, your what's your it's a muscle name? powerful attitude in their music, you know. What what's but your again? son's name? Detroit. Yeah. Well, so, you know, and how I was, serious he is. I'm sorry. I said that's how serious you are about Detroit music. You named yeah. your son Detroit. It's got a thing to it. It's got. Don't you, am I wrong in this? Do you do you hear it at all? Yeah. Did yeah. your boy Bruce do it like a Detroit medley? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, so, and you've also toured with uh, Alejandro Escovedo. Yeah, yeah. Good guy. Nice to me. Good man. Yeah. I showed up in this truck. <laughs> Very patient, man. I uh, when I moved to Austin the first time in '93, I knocked on his door. He didn't know what the hell I was. I was like, you know. Hi, I, I want to meet you. He was like, oh, come on in. We got to be friends. He was very, very wow. good. In retrospect, he was a good guy. Yep. So we're going to start to wind this down. I want to hear something um, funny. Can I tell you a little uh, Alejandro thing? And I think about it all the time. Yeah. I was concerned about some like credit card debt I had. And he said, oh, good credit rating. That's something you white people care about. <laughs> and I loved that. I thought that was hysterical. Do you have anything you want to? Say or, oh, you know what? Can you show us some of your paintings? Yeah. Now, yeah. not only is that a, a musician, but he's a great painter. Uh, Rose, um, <laughs> Rachel, can you put up that picture that Ed did of my wife and I? He he does paintings on on request. So if you have a favorite musical artist, or you want a painting of you and your family, or whatever, he will do them for you. Um, so, like this, they're up. Wait, like this is this is a picture that he painted of my wife and I and our two dogs. And that's a large painting. That's the big. It's in our living room. Yeah. So you know they're nine by twelves. So like here's Basquiat, and here's Keith Haring, and here's P.J. Harvey. And here's William Burroughs. When you're asking me who my we'll influence move them over in front of the camera. Oh, yeah, 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 it's flying. Put in the angel in Angelou. Oh, flying. Um, then, yeah, there's bigger ones. Right, who else? You want to see more? I got more. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, and, you know, and how can, how can people read? I said that at the merch table, there's a lot of paintings sold. And now, these days, frankly, because both New West and Righteous Babe don't deal in CDs anymore. So they were like, you want your CDs? I'm like, yeah, I want my CDs. So I got a boatload of CDs. But if you come to the merch table, I'll send you a free CD. I'm glad to do it. Um, give you a free CD with each purchase. And then uh, Stevie, oh, people are going big on this. People seem to dig the Stevie I'm doing, right? I know you're getting a glare. No, it looks good. Pussy Riot. Who do I want to tour with? Anybody, anybody that's they asked William Faulkner one time, what were you thinking about when you wrote The Sound and the Fury? And he said, Money. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll start with anybody, frankly. You know, that includes like, you, there's some great tours. Adi was a great tour. I toured with the Pogues, that was a great tour. I toured with uh, The Uncluded, which was Aesop Rock and Kimya Dawson. I toured with her quite a bit. That was a great tour. Uh, great crowds because her crowd is like 13 to 30 girl young ladies and his crowd is like 15 to 45 hip hop dudes and who were very receptive to a lot of lyrics and no melody so that was a good so like bowie and uh who else who's that i can't even say kurt vonnegut we saw a lot of kurt people like it and then there's yeah. a bigger one I, obviously this it's hard to show you but ooh, like this can you see that one, kind of? Yeah, uh-huh. And this, you know. And, you know, I think people, there was a period, of, it's it's hard if you're like a touring musician, particularly if you're in the South, to carry vinyl around. You got to be careful. It's going to warp. T-shirts is, you never know who, but, you know, paintings, one size fits all. And the last art lasts forever. And you get the impression people want to take something tangible home. And so I really only paint people that influence me. 
uh, I've refused. I'm not going to mention any names, but you know, I really, I don't, you don't, you have a new joke at hint, hint, not that you haven't heard that, um, you know, a guy and a wife are getting ready to go out. She tries on a dress, says, Hey, do I look fat in this? He says, you promise you won't get mad no matter what I'd say. She says, I promise. He said, I fucked your sister. That's like the newest one I got, really. Right. It's Rachel yeah. laughing. That's real. I'm really playing the whole gig to Rachel. I don't know. Zap, yeah. Oh. Zap, when you know, I'm doing Zap. Hey, let me tell you something. The first show I, first concert I ever went to was the Love and Spoonful. Okay. Right. The first three concerts I went to were the Love and Spoonful, The Who, and I met Keith Moon and Jimi Hendrix. Wow. Amazing. But I love Zalman Yanofsky. I was a big Love and Spoonful fan. And I've done a Zalman Yanofsky painting for uh, Tom Wood, who who is a singer songwriter who does, he plays in a love, he does many things. He's an excellent musician, but he's in a Love and Spoonful cover band who do it, like with the auto harp and the nice. bass. And so nice. and he wanted a Zal, and I, uh, and he runs a little. Uh, in the East Village, she's got a showcase room upstairs. I played a bunch of times. Good man, anyway. But I've done Zap, so man, and I've never done Joe Butler. But can you uh, can you take it out there. with a a, um, a song about hate crimes? No, hey, I'll do that for you, Harry. Huh? All those jokes were dirty. I I have a clean joke. Want to hear a clean joke? Yeah. <laughs> you didn't he wrote somebody wrote your jokes didn't have to be so nice. They were he's you know somewhere in the jokes. He's using a I was down in Sylvan eating cream banana where the heat just made me Do you know that song? Do you know the spoonful? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course. Did you have any other albums? I got them all. I met uh, John Sebastian. At the, one of his shows in Seattle. Right. Was, how was his voice? It wasn't great, but the, I mean, he playing any harmonica? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, he he did a thing where he harmonica. His, his harmonica. father was a classical. His father was a classical harmonica player. You know? No, I didn't. That's the fun of hanging around with me, Harry. You get to learn yeah. a lot of useless shit. Uh, okay, so what's you the background? What's the story on this song? Um, well, the three people in the song are Matthew Shepard, murdered, Laramie, Wyoming, gay youth, hung on a fence. And then, uh, sorry. And then, uh, let's see, Brandon Tina, trans youth. Uh, if you ever saw the movie Voice Don't Cry, Hillary Swank portrays him, Brando, and um, murdered. And then Brian Danique, and there was a, man, there's a movie about him that was just released. He was punk rock kid, Amarillo, Texas, murdered. So everybody, now, you know. Everybody. Well, I Met for coffee in heaven last week. And he said, I like my black. And he said, You ever want to go back? He said, No. We can be who we want to be. He said, now, we can be who we want to be. Matthew Shepard got by for dessert. And they asked Matthew, does it still hurt? And spit over the rail. It flew down to earth 
just like Pam. He said, now, we can be who we want to be. He said, now, we can be who we want to be. Down on earth, he held her tight, she held her tight, he held him tight, they held them tight. It was the morning, they cried all night, through the window, they saw the hail. He said, now, we can be who we want to be. Awesome. I want to give a, I want to give a big shout out. Thank you to Rachel for everything she's done to help me get do these live streams um and i want to thank you ed you're welcome i'm honored and thanks to the both of you and anybody else that tuned in and put up with all these shenanigans so uh it looks like alan said in the comments that he has a show so get in touch with alan afterwards yeah tomorrow's booking day for me okay well, and Thank you guys you. have coffee shop on hold, right? Yes. That's a yeah. go if we need it. Yeah, I'm still working on something else, too. I don't know um, about the double C there. I put in a, I don't want to say her name in case she wants to me, but I put in a, a bid to, but they just had their house remodeled. So I don't know they, like the Hamill tribe, you know, creating a bonfire in their living room. Well, thank you to everybody that's watching. I'm going to leave this up so that people can check it out later and watch it again. If they are if they weren't able to watch it now, they can uh, check it out later. Yeah, I'll give it a shout out tomorrow, uh, Harry, on the regular nonsense over on my channel. That's fantastic. Think, uh, you you love, everybody yeah. loves that right away. He's one of those people. You just love the guy. Thank you, Ed. You do, Rachel. That's sweet. Not everybody. Well, you <laughs> it know, ain't you for everybody, know. Rach. By hey, design. Listen. By design. You know what? Yeah. There's a but 73 it, million of them, I can guarantee, wouldn't go for it. I tell you one thing, Ed, is as long as you're being true to yourself and, and you're, 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 you've got your, the conviction of your own integrity and beliefs, then you push it and you make it happen. People oh, come around, you. they'll yeah, salute yeah. you for it. Yeah, back at you. Back at you. Okay. Yeah. Hey. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Harry. Thank you, Thank you Ed. Tell Becky Blazer I said hi. I will. She's watching. She's the one that's called USA Blues. Right uh, right there. Yeah. That's she's, my neck of the woods. Yeah, that's where Rachel li lives. Up in Canada here. All right, Harry. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.